you're listening to Season 4 of Seeking Refuge, a podcast sharing the stories of refugees. My name is Isha Hegde, and today, Aidan Thomason and I will be discussing the book, We Are Displaced, a collection of short stories of female refugees from across the world by Malala Yousafzai. So um, I think really my first question after reading the book, and also I like zoomed through this entire book. Um, I think it was really very fast paced, but also a very digestible read, if that makes sense. I liked how it was based out personally. But one thing that I was super surprised by while reading the book was the age of a lot of these girls. I think I was expecting to read the book and really like see maybe girls like my age, like young 20s, like, you know, but it was mostly girls who were a lot younger um, going through these horrible experiences going through the state of displacement. So Aiden, like, how did you feel reading this book and kind of witnessing, I guess, first person narrators or characters who were so much younger than you at a point or like around the age of personally my sister, like, you know, like 11, 12, 13, going through these events? Yeah. Um, it definitely was an emotional read because um, I know you have a younger sister. I have, my sister is 16 now. So she's like even a little older than some of these girls, but it's very, it's kind of one thing to picture yourself going through these things and like trying to understand that. But I think it's even that much harder when you're realizing that loved ones in your life that are even younger than you are having to deal with things that are picturing the idea of like someone you love who's younger than you having to walk through something like this. And I, I think it's it's also incredible because I think a lot of the girls like at the time of the story are nearer to our age, but at the time that they were displaced, they were a lot younger. And the idea of spending your entire teenage years, like formative moments of your life on the run and um, in this uncertainty and in these inadequate living conditions or in this like continual state of fear or constant movement or lack of resources was really intense. I I also, th- I'm glad you brought that up. Like they are closer to our age when they're maybe telling the story. And even I, I think I watched an um, interview of one of like the people in the chapters. And these are people who are now older than us. So, but it is kind of weird to me personally to think that these conflicts have been going on for so long. Like the gap between being like 10 or 11 and being like late teens is almost 10, that's almost a decade. And to think like that their formative years for a decade were taken up by this conflict is really harrowing. And really, it brings a lot of perspective, I think, to my life, because what I was worried about at 10 and 11 years old was nothing like what these you know, women were worried about at 10 and 11 years old, which is so heartbreaking to me to read. So I think that's, that was a really big shell shock for me when reading the book. And also something that I really thought about after reading the book, just how long these conflicts have been going on, how like, to us, they're just like, events that we see on the news, but there are people living through these events who just have had lives that are unfathomable to us personally. I think on even on top of that, though, of there's lots of moments in the book that are very relatable as a young woman. And I think that that also kind of speaks to the beauty of the writing of the book, but also the resilience and complexity that lies in like these women, because like there's moments where even though they're fleeing conflict, they're still like, oh, I wanted to join the soccer team and I played like on the soccer team or I was trying to get an education in the middle of, and like, those are things that we, that are very relatable or like I had this relationship with my sister, even in the middle of this. These like common experiences are fundamentally changed and like sometimes taken away by this conflict, but these young women are still allowed to be complex and have all of these wants and dreams and 
also just the normal aspects of being a teenager um, or even down to like little details about like Malala was talking in her story about she went to college at Oxford after like she was resettled and um, talking about the difference in just how fish tastes at home versus in the UK, things like that, that are very common experiences that are a different if you're in conflicts, but aren't necessarily subsumed by the conflict, which I thought was very powerful. No, I agree. I think um, looking at how the normalcy of these young women had changed throughout the story um, was definitely saddening, but also eye-opening to see. Um, I think in a lot of the interviews that we do personally on the podcast and a lot of the interviews that I listen to and edit for people on the podcast, that is like one of the more, I guess, majorly saddening points for me, um, especially when, you know, these people who are helping refugees or refugees themselves talk about the moment that they saw their lives take a turn during these events and how that was just like continual. And also the slight moments like during their periods of conflict where they are given, you know, like a temporary return to normalcy. And I think that like temporary return to normalcy, oh, trying out for the soccer team or having a good time with your sister, like we saw within this book. Um, I think it's almost more painful to me as a reader to see that and then see them zapped back to the reality of their life. I think that was one of the most painful things for me while reading this book. There's definitely lots of points in the book where um, I know in the part that Malala is narrating, but also in the parts where the girls are telling their stories that there, there are like distinct moments. I like how you said that of where they're like, oh, like someone mentioned that we might have to flee, but that didn't make sense. Or like, I was young and this thing happened, but I was kind of sheltered from it because I was young. And then later was realizing what had happened of, um, I think those moments also made it stand out more in terms of like, these things really can happen to anyone, people all over the world. And so seeing those points where, I guess I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, but seeing those points where, things turn from normalcy to this state of displacement and seeing how if you had a quote unquote normal life, it would have just gone in one trajectory. But like seeing those moments where like, oh, I identify where you are, but see that your life is now about to go in a different way. than And that's one of the things that I think I was thinking about while reading this book very specifically. I think reading a book is very different from doing an interview for obvious reasons but also when I think you're doing an interview for the podcast you know like you're very in the moment and sometimes you don't have time to absorb the people's stories until like you're editing or after the interview but I think while reading this book I had like a continual absorption of the um, events that were going on in these women's lives and you know like if I wanted to replay something in my head I didn't have to ask anyone to repeat it I could just flip the page you know back and I think that's one thing that I really enjoyed about the fact that um or I really appreciate about the fact that this book was released because I do think a lot of people are unaware of the circumstances that these individuals go through and I think it's a really I I think the book is in a way, like a plethora of information, like a collection of information for people. I think it was extremely informative as well as a narrative story that was enjoyable to read and like kept me hooked throughout the book. So I really appreciated that about it. I, you know, although I guess I can't really comment on any inaccuracies, I liked how it was like, like an autobiography, but also a narrative story that like I as a reader felt a part of so I really enjoyed that aspect of the book and transitioning to another question that I had so oftentimes I feel like for our podcast and just in general when we are watching news stories and stuff personally I guess for me I find that a lot of the times um 
stories of refugees or stories of people in crisis tend to encompass a general population group and not specifically like subsets of that population, like the women, the children, the men. So obviously the book centered around girls who are displaced throughout their life. So do you think we can definitively say that women, young girls are impacted differently than men? And do you think that difference is, I don't want to say better or worse, but do you think it is of a different type of suffering? I will say that. So there's also, I mean, there's lots of ways to look at that, both in terms of women who can witness about their experiences and also in terms of studies, like academically that look at like the different effects of gender on displacement. Um, But I will say that this book is very insightful to like exactly how um, girls and young women are affected by um, displacement. And I think that like, well, I don't think it's obvious that these experiences are gendered in a number of different ways. Um, And I think the most salient way specifically in this book, um, and I know on like Malala Yousafzai's life story in general, is the difference in education that girls receive and like that's excess, especially exacerbated in displacement. Um, I mean, you can look across their stories in here and see how, and in Malala specifically about how lots of times like girls will be denied access to school, both by oppressive governments that they end up having to flee and also in displacement, just because sometimes there's a lack of resources and girls education, unfortunately, is usually the first thing to go when you have to choose who's getting educated. And then there's also like gendered violence and um, that's specifically directed at women and different effects of trauma. Um, and I think that's that's all really present in this book, but in a specifically individual way rather than like a systemic looking at the macro level of like what happens during war or conflict, looking at how these girls' educations were interrupted, their normal development as women was interrupted and they're experiencing displacement differently based on their gender. I, I completely um, agree with you. I think that, I, and I like wanted to bring this up, I found it interesting how that throughout like several of the stories within the book, a constant trend, unfortunately, was that the education of these young girls was just immediately sidelined. And I think a lot of the interviews that I've done and listened to for the podcast, that is something that has been confirmed Um, just that the education of women going through these harrowing situations is immediately put aside. I guess another question that we like kind of talked about before was what was one story or part within the book that stood out to you or that you were personally more drawn to, I guess, or kind of like left you thinking a whole lot after reading it? I think I have one is would be um, I kind of briefly mentioned this already, but the story of um, Zainab and Sabrine, um, how they were sisters that have been separated. Um, and I think there was a lot of aspects of that one, because I have one sister and I'm my younger sister and I'm like very protective of her. And I can't imagine that opportunity having to make the choice of whether to build a better life for myself by being resettled in the U S and then giving her a better chance to come over, but also taking that risk of her not being able to come, which is in fact what happened to them. And I think another aspect of that story besides the personal is how directly it was affected by the U S's political context at the time. I think Zainab came over shortly before Trump's executive order that was known as the Muslim ban. I don't remember like the technical, whatever order Mm -hmm. it was. Um, and how like when refugee resettlement was stalled, which this is something that's that's happened to families before is that one person will be accepted and someone else isn't. And you don't know, and there's no clear reason why. And then they're spent months and years thinking that they're going to get them over. And then the government, whether by policy or bureaucracy or vague, ambiguous reasons that you can't figure out won't accept the other person or won't for years. And you're just fighting like a battle that you can't really see. And that happens normally, but then that combined with the slashing of refugee admissions and then the Muslim ban that prevented her from 
go, being able to travel to Belgium with her soccer team and see her sister, even though her sister's visa hadn't been accepted to the U.S. and didn't know if it ever would be, that she was even denied that ability to go visit her. And I think that's that moment also really stuck out, I think, because that was something that was talked about in such a surface level context on the news all the time, but we never examined like, the human impacts of that. Um, and that's even something that we've talked to. And even beyond the podcast, I've talked to refugees um, that are Muslim about that before and how physically unsafe they felt during that time because of how clearly that was targeted at them and how they felt suddenly, even if they had perfect resettlement status and their family was here, they felt like they were insecure here because of that, even though we were just talking about it on a very macro surface level, throwing it around in the news, like it had very direct human impacts. Um, so I think that that two reasons that their story stuck out to me the most. Um, and then there was another one of, I think it was Maria's story where her father was killed by, I believe by a gang and her mother just hid that from them. And they fled immediately because she knew that they were coming next. And the fact that her mother carried that to shield her children from that painful knowledge while they were fleeing. And the fact that they're still stuck in poverty in another part of Colombia, um, and that she was carrying that for years really stuck out to me as well. That was a specific moment in her story. So for me, I think just like you, all of the stories in the book really stood out to me. Um, but I was especially drawn to Zainab and Sabrina's story because just like you, I do have a younger sister. And, you know, I think, you know, you're reading a good book when you get extremely emotionally attached to all the characters, even though these are actual people or, you know, their, their narratives. And the point where um, Zainab, who is the older sister, I believe, right? It's been a while since I've read the book as well. But at the point when her, um, you know, like visa or application gets approved while her younger sisters did not, just like that moment, like tore my heartstrings completely. And um, I find it appalling that this is the situation that is occurring and it has really happened to so many people that, you know, I was unaware of because I think whenever I'm thinking about um, situations like this personally, I do like to think of the continuity of a family and like a unit or a group of people going through this suffering together, which doesn't make it any better. But the fact that there is, I guess, separation from your loved ones and not just displacement from the setting that you're in, but displacement from people in your immediate family or displacement from your cultural group altogether, especially during the very formative years of your life is something that I think I was aware of, but didn't fully understand the implications of. So that's why I really enjoyed um, Zainab and Sabrine's story, A, because having a younger sister that was really, I guess, um, emotionally jarring for me to hear so it did like get a strong emotional reaction out of me but I kind of found myself realizing that there were two forms of displacement I guess after reading this um, particular chapter their particular chapters I think there is like a physical displacement from your area your living situation like a separation from your culture but there's also the physical displacement from your family members and immediate people that you care about. And I think those two things coupled together um, was, I, I think I'd always thought of them as separate entities, but when I realized that they were constantly coupled together within these situations after reading those particular chapters within this book, I was kind of like, I, I like took a step back and I like really like closed the book. Like I thought about it and I thought about how that is something that I personally want to bring up in future interviews, kind of how there is this duality of displacement where it's not just physical displacement, but maybe like an emotional displacement from yourself and everything you knew about yourself because you're separated from those close to you. That was another 
part that I had marked in the book of, I think, I think it was just in the introduction, she was talking about how like refugees are supposed to feel like gratitude for being resettled and like glad that they're safe, but nobody allows them to, to dwell on the, the trauma that is inflicted by, even though I am safe, I'm possibly separated from my family and I'm certainly separated from my culture and everything that is, that has like made up my life. Um, so I think that was, I really like that you brought that up because it was very present in the book. Um, so a personal story for me, I also have a second one that really stood out for me. And if it's fine, I might read a little excerpt that really drew me in to the story because I found myself relating to this character um, on a personal level. So um, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing this name wrong, but it's Nala, N-A-J-L-A, I believe. Do you, um, sorry if that is not an accurate pronunciation of the name, but um, I think in Malala's like, introduction of that chapter, she talks about how like the Yazidi community in general, which is the community that Nala belongs to, it's extremely small. I think it's less than a million people concentrated in um, Iraq and parts of Syria and Turkey. So my family is from India, um, but I also speak a very small Indian dialect that not a lot of people have heard of. And so immediately I was drawn into this story of, so I, I guess I would say like, although I am ethnically a minority in America. I'm also a minority within my extended family in India. And my extended family in India is my cultural group in India is like extremely concentrated into this one very small region of the country itself. So I was immediately drawn into that introduction of the story because I found it relatable to me personally. Um, and then I just wanted to read an excerpt from this chapter that I think really drew me in and also that I found extremely harrowing. So is that okay if I do that or would you yeah. So um, I finished my first year of secondary school, but in 2012, my sister's husband, a soldier, was murdered. Immediately after that, my friend and neighbor burned herself alive on purpose. One of her brothers had heard that she had had a boyfriend and told her father. She was scared that she, she was so scared that she said there was no choice but death. When I saw her run out to her home engulfed in flames, something broke inside of me. I couldn't focus on my education at all. I was miserable. I went back to school in 2013 and felt that I was becoming a whole person again. I was determined to finish secondary school and go to college. But in August of 2014, ISIS shattered those dreams. So I think after reading this, I found that my actualization of these events were that these refugee crises, and maybe this, this is obviously extremely naive of me, were the, I guess, worst or only points of suffering that these people were experiencing in their lives. But after reading this, I kind of, it not so much dawned on me, but I kind of like fully had like a, you know, light bulb moment that these individuals are going through already difficult periods in their life like for example her friend you know burning herself alive or her sister's brother passing away Th those are extremely horrible situations um, for individuals to be in and I already think that is reflective of the fact that there were problems you know going on within her community that were not related to displacement or being a refugee or you know militant groups like ISIS coming in but I think a lot of these I guess groups or entities that come in and do displace these people kind of take advantage of the fact that these people's lives may already be in um, a bad state and I think just that suffering from, you know, that these situations of displacement may not even be the first bad things or horrible situations that these people have been in was really eye-opening to me after reading this because I was like, 
oh, wow, like that is that is really bad. And I thought she was going to be like, this all happened, you know, when, you know, living under ISIS conflict. And then she was like, and then in 2014, ISIS shattered those dreams. And I was like, whoa, this is all pre-ISIS um, contact, which I think was extremely like light bulb moment for me. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, it kind of, I think that also broadens the experience too of thinking of this is like literally the most general statement you can make, but like bad things happen to everyone and all the time, even in life. And so like sometimes this displacement subsumes like other aspects of your life that may have also been difficult, but just that people are dealing with this on top of other trauma that they've experienced, whether as a result of conflict or not, is, is also really powerful. Um, do you have any other questions that you want to bring up real quick? I think this is maybe like, I'll try to think of a question out of it, but there is also something that I thought of specifically with, um, well, with all of them, but let me specifically the story of Marie Claire um, from the Congo. And then I think Jennifer was the woman in the U.S. that became like her, I think they called her her American mom or something. Um, But I think that story like stuck out the most, but I think the theme continues in the book of like this idea of found community and found family, like even in the midst of displacement, um, which I think really stuck out to me of the fact that like Marie Claire and her family watched their mother be killed in front of them at the beginning of their displacement journey. That's obviously traumatic and terrible. And I would imagine that every refugee has, well, I'm not, I would imagine like, it's true that everyone who's a refugee probably has some kind of experience similarly traumatic, but then still the fact that you can go through and life moves on and you can find like new families in these places that you are displaced to. Um, so I just wanted to see like maybe what your thoughts were about the ideas of like found community and found family and found friends, even through displacement, like in all of their stories. Yeah. So I think initially for the girls within this story, although this found family, this new home was comforting because it maybe provided more safety than they were in previously. It was also a constant reminder that they would never be able to return to normalcy. And it was almost like a double-edged sword. So, you know, like, although, or I guess not double-edged sword, but like, although there was this protection and this safety and almost like this completely idyllic life in comparison to the one that they were living, it was also a constant reminder that anything good about the place that they were living in previously was completely gone and in the past and unattainable to them now. And sorry, while you were talking, I was um, going through, so I've like, I have the ebook. So I'm like, I like highlighted certain points and I definitely highlighted um, something in Marie Claire's story. Um, I think it was the fact that Marie Claire at the end of her story kind of oh yes um I think it's when Marie Claire acknowledges that there was safety in Zambia um there were a ton of other refugees there but it was the fact that she said people in Zambia did not want us here they would shout at us in the streets go back to your country why are you here kids would insult me and my siblings at school even throwing rocks we did not belong here, but we had nowhere else to go. So I think it's that recognition that although there is um, safety in an area and immediate safety, a that there may not be total acceptance outside of that found family or that found feeling of safety in general. And also that there is nowhere else to go in these situations that you have to make do with what you have. And I think for me personally, that is unimaginable. Um, You know, I I think that is extremely saddening to hear that these horrible situations of non-acceptance are almost dealt with because of that immediate shelter, safety, food, like found family that you create in these regions. So I think 
I was trying to find something that I highlighted in Marie Claire's story that really brought that out to me. The fact that, you know, she was living through this torment and had nowhere else to run to and had to live through that torment continually. Yeah. That's also, that was something that came up in a bunch of these girls stories of the idea that fleeing wasn't a choice. And it also makes me think of the really famous poem by Worsen Shire, where she says, you only leave home if home is the mouth of a shark. That's a really important idea to not lose some more, like thinking about displacement is this idea that it's, you might call it a choice, but it's really survival. Like it's, it's not a decision. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. what you have to do to keep living. Yes. I, I cannot agree I cannot agree more. And also, I guess, kind of going back to that quote from Marie Claire, another thing that I found in a lot of these stories were, was obviously that these individuals were, um, you know, accepted in their areas. And do you, like, what do you think about that? What do you think is running through the minds of these children, I guess, who have grown up in, you know, places like Zambia when they are, introduce these refugees and why do you think there is that immense retaliation I guess between kids their own age because I think there were several instances of that throughout the book where you know other kids their age who'd grown up in these areas were you know super felt super separated from them and often retaliated at them yeah I mean I guess I don't know but I will say that just generally behavior like that is typically learned. So I'm sure that, I mean, that's like a pretty common idea in psychology of that children start out as neutral, but if they're taught that, because I think there's a mistaken idea in places where refugees come to. And I mean, we see it very clearly in our own context in the U.S. that refugees are some kind, somehow a threat or a bad thing or something, something negative. I mean, you can hear in the U.S. like this idea of an invasion, which is incorrect and unhelpful in a number of different ways. But I think when kids are seeing that, they're impressionable. And so that if that's what they're hearing from adults or the news or wherever that they're hearing that from, it's, they like pick up on it and learn that behavior, which is really sad because then it perpetuates this cycle of refugees not being respected and not being welcomed and not being accepted. No, I agree. And I think furthermore, after reading this book, I realized that there is immense separation from individuals maybe personally suffering in their lives um, and then the suffering of individuals who are displaced physically from their home. Um, I think there's like an immense divide. So in a lot of these stories, I think you hear that you know the areas that these people are placed in aren't that good at all although like it is a very big improvement from you know the situation that they were living in there are problems in these new homes that they see as well and in the communities um in their you know found homes that they see as well but you know even those problems are kind of I guess you can't rank suffering, but they're just of a different caliber than the problems that these individuals um, experienced growing up. And they're almost, I mean, I do think there is a difference between, you know, like watching your mom get killed, for example, or, you know, like seeing death firsthand that a lot of people and a lot of children in these um found homes that are not refugees have not experienced, obviously. And I think that's like an immediate separation. I think this is one of the first things that we talked about, but the immense amount of pain and strife that these, you know, girls and children in general who are in these situations have seen at such a young age, I think definitely has, of course, an impact on them, but almost like separates them from their peers. And leads them to kind of like, I guess, accept this retaliation that they might get from their peers because they don't want to return to that really dark state that they were originally in. And also they think, maybe I got the impression that any form of suffering was better than that. And, you know, it can't be as 
worse as it was before because I do have a roof over my head and access to food and immediate safety right now. So I found it interesting how there was almost like this, I guess, circumnavigation of comfort and the fact that these individuals had immediate comfort or immediate safety, I will say not comfort, was almost triumphed over the individual struggles that they were facing on a day-to-day basis, such as bullying and school children or, you know, like other adults making mean comments at them. And that was almost brushed aside because they had this immediate safety right in front of them. This makes me, this is a little bit tangential from the book, but this makes me think of an article I read last year when I was researching, um, I was researching like education outcomes for resettled refugees. And there's a study from Canada that their big takeaway was, I think about this, like in their conclusion where they were talking about how they could see a big measurable difference in the performance and outcomes of resettled refugee students in Canada based on how their peers interacted with them. And so they were saying that like maybe the key to improving like outcomes for resettled students is to educate the students that aren't displaced about what the process of displacement is like and about how to be um how to respond to their needs and like how to be sensitive and welcoming to them while like understanding what they've been through um which is something that's pretty lacking at least in the education that I received I never learned about migration at all which I think is an interesting thing that I find myself thinking about a lot of how much better we could make the situation of displacement, even even just like ignoring solving the problems of conflict as an international community of if we knew and if children knew how to be compassionate and sensitive and understanding of displaced students. Oh, no, I completely agree. I think um, through the podcast, I have been thankfully informed of more information regarding displacement, regarding the lives of refugees and those who help them. But I think there was even more information and realities that I learned through this book. And I realized, you know, I am 19 years old and I'm still being faced with a lot of truths regarding the situation. And I just think that it would be extremely beneficial if these situations of struggle were introduced to younger people because you know not to be cliche but we are the future and you know all of that so I think that um it would be extremely beneficial if this book even was because you know I think like there are certain age appropriate materials that you can hand out to school age children to describe these situations I feel like this book could be handed to a high school student or maybe even like a late middle school student and you know they could read it and take away something from it and be informed by it. Um, And I think there is age appropriate, age conscious material that we can create for children, especially around us because, you know, and young people around us, because, you know, we are the future, we are going to be making a future change. And I think in order to make future change, we have to be continually informed. And I think if there isn't material books out like this, you know, documentaries out like this earlier, we, you know, watched that movie or documentary together. If there isn't material out there that is reflective of these sources or these situations of struggle, I just think um, the ability even for young people or anyone really to understand what's going on is diminished. So I just think, um, I'm glad that these women in this book shared their stories and I'm glad that Malala was able to encompass all of them because I think it is incredibly important to have material and reading and out there like this because it gives people even who may not have opportunity to hear about it in school or in their daily lives or on the news to pick this up and find some information out. So Yeah, I think this was an incredibly enjoyable and informative read. Not, I think it was incredibly informative, not just to read, but just in its entirety as a novel. I hope that um, more books like this are created. And I definitely want to read more books like this. Um, I definitely think I'm going to start encompassing 
a list of books centering around displacement because I think as someone who did not have the opportunity to learn about displacement in her, I guess, schooling prior to college, really, I think books like this are important because they fill in the gaps of my knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. And I, especially like any teenagers that might happen to be listening to this, I would especially recommend this book, but I, I agree that this book and more like it are really important to read. Um, And I'm looking forward to us doing more things like this in the future with other books of just because even if we're, we're learning about these things, we're not, you, you and I don't have firsthand experience of this. And I would imagine most of our listeners also don't have firsthand experience, but these women do and their stories are very eloquently told very well told from a literary perspective and also very moving from a human perspective in this book. And it's, it's just a very important read to, to be able to listen just to people who have gone through this. I think also there are interviews that girls from this book have done outside, you know, like after this book was written currently now. And I really recommend watching those as well. I can't remember the, um, Oh, it was Mizun. She did, I think, a TED Talk that I ended up watching. And I really do want to follow along the individual stories of these women as well, you know, if they are in the public light. Um, So, yeah, I think it's just one of those books that all of the stories, all of the parts really stick with you and you want to be involved in these young women's lives even today. So, yeah, definitely go read it. (laughs) Yeah, we, I mean, we all know that Malala Yousafzai herself is remarkable, but there's this this book full of just remarkable women and remarkable, very young women. So I'm excited to see what they do in the future. That was Isha and me talking about Malala Yousafzai's recent book, We Are Displaced. We both absolutely loved it, and we think you will too. If you want to buy her book, we have links in the show notes. It's available at all major booksellers, but we always encourage you to buy local when you can. If you liked this episode, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us in the comments below. If you want more book reviews in the future, let us know. If you'd like to get in touch with us, email us at seekingrefugepodcast at gmail.com. Follow us at Refuge Podcast on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook for all the updates on our show. As always, thank you for listening, and we'll see you in the next one.